Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it, and we hope you really enjoy tonight's talk. Um, we are Yes Tomorrow Design Build School. Um, anybody with Yes Tomorrow want to raise their hands? Um, so we teach design and building classes and craft and woodworking over in Waitsfield, Vermont. Um, our January through March classes were just scheduled, so those are on our website, and we've also got some catalogs. I'm going to throw these out into the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Except I can't. Um, and outside, uh, we have, this is part of our speaker series, uh, which began last month and will go through mid-November. Um, later this month, we've got another talk coming up. Uh, that one will be held at the North Branch Nature Center, and there will be seats for everybody. <laughs> um, that one will be featuring a landscape architect from Northeastern University, and he'll be talking about designing public places in a way that allow people to interact with nature while improving the ecosystem around them. Um, and that will be Wednesday, September 26th, two weeks from now, at 7 p.m. Uh, North Branch Nature Center. And uh, two weeks from that, Wednesday, October 10th, we'll be in Burlington. We're taking the show on the road a little bit. Um, that talk will be about living roofs, green roofs with plants on them. Um, and that will be at Main Street Landing Performing Arts Center in Burlington, Wednesday, October 10th, also at 7 p.m. Um, let's see. I think, I think that's about all I have to say. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Thea Alvin and Mac Rood. Hey. Hi. So, uh, I'm an architect and a builder. Thea is a mason, best mason I know. There may be some other masons out here who are in competition. I don't know, but she's the best one I know. Um, Still learning. We have been, uh, we're both teachers at Yes Tomorrow, and we have been associated with this project that you've been. Please speak up a little, please. Sure. Uh, we've, been we've been working on this project for the last eight years uh, in collaboration with an outfit called the Canova Association. Uh, you'll see we have a location map to show you where it is, but it's in northern Italy. And uh, the Canova Association is dedicated to uh, a mission of uh, increasing appreciation and preservation of vernacular masonry architecture in this area. Italy is rich in architecture, and until fairly recently, people you know, disregarded buildings that were a mere five or six hundred years old, you know. It's too new. Fo too new, focused on Roman and Greek and Etruscan and Renaissance and everything. But, but uh, partially through the work of the Canova Association, um, <laughs> people are beginning to recognize the value of these buildings. And uh, you've been seeing a smattering of slides here. We're going to start the slideshow by showing you just some images of the architecture in the region, but uh, spend most of our time uh, showing you the projects that we have been working on and how they progress. Both we've, we've done walls, we've done many roofs, we've done a vault, we've done an oven, uh, always using the techniques from five or six hundred years ago. I, mean, we, I, I take pride, I'm sure Thea does too, in the fact that we've had architectural historians come visit our projects and say they can't tell which is the new and which is the old part. We use you know, exactly the same techniques that, that uh, were used when the buildings were originally built. Um, and and I, I enjoy looking at the old vernacular construction techniques because they teach me what the rules are. The buildings that have lived 500 years say what you can and can't do. And I use those as my guidelines. Stone is very different from brick. Brick has real specific things that it can do and limitations. And stone, for me, is limitless. And when you see it in this application, it's profound. And, and I think what's really fascinating about it is that unlike most of the masonry in this country, which is a veneer, uh, the masonry 
in Italy and specifically in this area, it's it's structural. So, I mean, just to Thea's point, you're seeing, you know, here's what masonry can do. So, Sophie, how do we get the PowerPoint going? <laughs> I realized that was an important part of it right. after, after I left. And by the way, we encourage you to ask questions, interrupt us, you know, in the course of the slideshow if you see something that you want to know more about, or gee, how did we do that? Packed with information. Yeah, please uh, speak up. So, and we'll just interchange. This is, so what we do, I guess we should start out, we, we teach a two-week course in, uh, in this area, it's in Doma Dosala. Um, and the course is half on-site construction and half design work. And you'll see at the very end some slides of our studio work and the work that we do in, in the studio. Our lecture tonight is mostly on the on-site hands-on work. But uh, the, the philosophy of yes tomorrow in general is that you can't be a good builder unless you're also a designer, and you can't be a good designer unless you're also a builder. So we really emphasize the fact that in order to understand these buildings, you need to you know, do a design project around them. So we have the students go into the abandoned village of Gesh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, choose a building, and design a project for that building, and you present can, it at the end. You can see that this roof is constructed of stone, and it's, it's old, the stone is thick, and this roof is also stone, but it's much more new. So one of the first parts of the project is to observe the roof and see if it's structurally sound. And if the stone has slumped, you know that it's not. Yeah. So can we, low, can we lower the lights? We might be able to see it better. Yeah, probably. Is the one that says stage just turn it off? Like <coughs> that? Is that? Look, there's my head. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going? Yeah. It's all the way. Unless we turn them off. It's better. Okay. So this is where, this is the student accommodations. This is where we live. It's awful. <laughs> um, here's a map of Italy. We're way in the northern part, right up against the Swiss border. And this is an inset of it. The Ossola Valley is this valley right here, which if uh, there was more water, it would be an extension of Lago Maggiore. Mm -hmm. Here's Doma Dossola. I'd say it takes about a half an hour to drive from one end, of, or 45 minutes to drive from one end of the valley to the other. It's not very large. And this is the, the farmer house kitchen where we prepare our meals. And then this is the uh, sort of common area between, and there's a splashing little river that's been diverted from the mountain stream, and it follows down between uh, the house and the studio, so you can hear water on either side of you all the time. This is the village of Canova, which has been restored. This is the model by which we have undertaken the construction. And this is an overhead view of the village of Gesh, of the foundation structures. And you can see um, some of the restoration work that is underway. This is a much more modern image, and this is when we first began. Both of those are very, very old photos from the very beginning of when we arrived in the village. So this village has been uninhabited for at least 100 years, maybe 150. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty small. It's whatever, 20, 20 houses. Um, and it's typical of the villages in this area. The villages are you know, only five minutes walk apart from each other, but they're, they're dense clusters surrounded by agricultural mm -hmm. terraces mostly. Mm -hmm. And what's the reason that the villages have been abandoned is that the hillside villages became less uh, enticing in terms of agricultural development and people moved down into the valley, much as they have in Vermont, I would say. Do you confront questions of, of contested ownership, anything like that? The, the Canova Association, which is trying to acquire these buildings in Canova, yeah, I mean in Gesh, yes, definitely run into issues with that. As Thea was saying, 
a minute ago before we started, one of the problems is that every one of these buildings, I mean, like a building like that, which hardly looks like a building at this point, may be owned by 50 different people. You know, and, and somebody. And it looks like this, and they don't want to sell it. And somebody may own that corner of the room, and somebody may, may own this corner of the room. And. Uh, so I'd like yeah. you guys, if you can, to look at this. See this wall here? Keep this building in your vision and the space beside it, because this has been a primary focus of ours over the last couple of years, right here. And one of the ways that we can tell how long the houses have been abandoned is by the age of the trees that are growing inside of them. Yeah. Yeah. Or by the dates, like here's 1621, 1561. They're old buildings. It, it, it is interesting to see uh, the different ways, and well, there's some other slides of lintels and spans. They do incorporate wood into a lot of these buildings, mostly chestnut, which is very rot resistant. So you can see here a corner of a house construction. To build a proper corner, you have a long piece of stone that's long this way and it's short on the other side. And then the next piece that's above it is short on the long side of the one below it and long on the short side. So you can alternate that pattern and create a very strong corner. And then if you take that as a rule, you can look at a wall such as this one and understand which part of the construction that you're looking at was first, second, or third based on the construction techniques of the corner. You can see that this is clearly a column because of the running joints, these straight lines. This is a column that supported a whole side of a house. This is a wall that infills, and this is a different kind of column. It's round, and it's made with lime and mortar. And then this is another whole kind of wall altogether. So part of what we do is assess what's there, who made it, and try and figure out the timeline of the process of those folks. We don't just go in and rip it down because we have a vision. We want to rebuild and make these houses reusable as themselves. And we first have to understand what that is. Do you import stone or you just use what? We use local stone. But we, we do buy or are given a lot of material if the stone is broken. Okay. Yeah. So this is, before we move on, a good kind of cross-section of a wall. You can see the walls are about, what, 60, 20 inches? 60 centimeters. 60 centimeters, about that thick. Uh, you, you could explain how it's done, but basically two faces and, and rubble fill in between. So thick enough so that you can go two or three stories with it and still have it stand on its own. This building on that, that particular wall that you see with the slot window and this lower window, that's the one that we most recently <coughs> tore down and rebuilt. And through the progression of slides you'll see that one come up again. This is the building that I wanted you to remember from the first slot, the, a few slides back of the huge trees in the way. So here it is with all of these trees growing on it. We found in the in this room, this is the same building here, new staircase, you can tell by the, by the door frame. In the bottom of that, originally the whole roof and the walls and everything had imploded. It was about six feet thick of debris. And we cleaned that out. And in the very bottom of it, there was a lime floor. It was perfectly smooth and sloped to a hole in the very bottom of it. Mm. And all the windows in it were slotted. And so the conclusion that I came to, being me, and right, <laughs> and wrong a lot, um, was that it was a room that people, you could dump your grapes into, the slotted window, and then you had this smooth basin, and you could, you know, it's the traditional Italian grape stomping room. The ladies with the skirts and the, you know, squeegee toes and everything. That was my idea. What's interesting about this group of slides, the, the buildings tend to be quite small. I'd say, you know, the width of this room is the width, or, or even slightly narrower, is the width of a typical one of these buildings. And so they tend to, in terms of architectural planning, put as much outside of the building as possible, specifically stairs. Uh, stairs take up a lot of room, and if in a very 
small space, you tried to have interior stairs, mm -hmm. you'd waste half of your space. Mm -hmm. And the stairs, since they make virtually everything out of masonry, mm -hmm. as you can see, are cantilevered stones the, sticking out of the, these are out the, of the wall with spacers on the ends. Do you use no mortar? We use mortar. Mortar, in the old days, lime was very precious. It's very hard to get lime, and the development of the kiln process uh, is way up in the mountains. It takes days and days to make lime. So the wealth of the house was be able to be determined by if you had lime in your kitchen, because that's where you'd want to prevent wind and draft and water from infiltrating. Normally, the animals are in the basement, the people live in the middle, and the food and the grain and the hay and the whatever is stored above you. So the living room, if you will, would have lime and mortar inside if you were rich. As a plaster. As you know, a plaster. And not as a, necessarily as a bonding right. for the stones. Yeah. So uh, just, to, just as they have stairs on the outside, they make liberal use of suspended balconies and lofts and, you know, here's another suspended balcony, projections out of the building, mm -hmm. which are obviously not pr as protected, but just expand the space to some extent. This is a picture of uh, a tower that, a building that started in Roman times. I mean, everything there has, you know, it just constantly evolves. <laughs> it, uh, at the base of this is a Roman structure and then it's been added to over the next thousand years. And the mortar in the base of that is from crushed Roman bricks. Wow. <laughs> do they get snow there? They do. They do. Uh, although, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's more elevation change here than, I mean, in, in Italy, in the Oslo Valley, than we have here. So down in the, on the floor of the valley, there are palm trees. And, and yet there's, uh, perpetual s snow it's in the mountains. Al it's the Alps. It's yeah. So, and, and you can walk easily in half a day from the palm trees to the snow. In the winter, it does snow. It's not as brutal as it is here. It doesn't get as cold. So, not at all. they don't have deep foundations, interestingly. They don't, here we, of course, have to go at least four feet down to get below the frost level they barely go a foot into the ground. Because there's also bedrock. You just start on the, on the rock and go up from there. It's not going to move. Right. So these are just more lofts and whatnot. Oftentimes, the top floor of the building is a hayloft. Mm -hmm. And often, the ground, the ground floor of the building is for animals, you know, either that or, or wine storage, a cantina. And then there are all sorts of ways that you can span, you know, uh, to create lintels. When you're doing it with stone, it's going to be either an arch or it's going to be, you know, a large stone like here or here or here. And the amount of purchase you can see on the side of these stones is ridiculous. Some of them is only one inch. So for a stone that weighs seven or eight hundred pounds, it's sitting on an inch of something and a prayer. And, but it's, you know, this, this particular building is a thousand years old, and obviously it works. So what we do here, we overbuild and we build these massive strong structures, and in this climate, um, this technique works. They don't have earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> the, center, the center bottom photo, can you explain the lintel on the right? This guy? Yeah. yeah, I mean so these are these infill. are. It's an infilled window. Yeah, it was a, it was a window. It's been oh. infilled. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I, I thought you meant these things are yes, yeah. way over designed, kind of. That's what I meant. Ties into the side wall. Got it. Okay. And the top right photo is that two pieces of stone that make the lintel, or is no? That's one piece it's with a uh, an, uh, cross carved into it. Oh, okay. Oh. So, just a, a couple slides on the industry in the Oslo Valley. It, the main industry in the Oslo Valley is stone, 
still is. There are a lot of quarries, mostly marble quarries, and specifically there's this marble quarry, which is the source of all the stone for the Duomo Cathedral in Milan, which is under constant renovation, interestingly. And the main guy who is creating the replacement pieces is the father and son team in, in the Osola Valley, just down below the, the uh, quarry. So they get the, you know, get a piece off of the Duomo here we are up on the roof. I mean, every one of these pieces is carved intricately. They'll take an old piece, rotted stone down, and they'll duplicate it, smash up the old one, deliver the new one. Is that kind of stone? It's marble. It's marble. Uh, this is, these are photos of a stone shed that we regularly visit. Um, he makes both basically bricks, I guess you could call them stone bricks, uh, and slabs. And you can see how nicely this stone splits. It's, uh, it's a granite, it's a, a type of granite, but it's uh, metamorphic rock, so it has... Nice. <laughs> you know, it's nice, it's called. And so it, it does have seams in it, like a set, like a sedimentary rock. So you can split it quite easily. Um, and this is what he does all day long. Him, his son, and a couple of workers. And they invite us. This is his son here, and him. And his name is Gian Piero Guglielmazzi. And um, we always bring him a bottle of wine, and he gives us peaches and things off his trees. But you can split that you can in I'd say what like three minutes sure uh, something like that you just you just make a seam along there tapping you see, with they, they have a hammer drill so they they have us do it the old-fashioned way with wedge and feathers just like down in Barry so the feathers are two angled pieces and the wedge is a is the splitting tool that goes down between the two angled pieces which they call Americans Americani. So you, you drill a hole you put the <laughs> and you split them open. And he hits, he hits in order. He'll hit a couple taps on each one and come down one, two, three, four, five. And you can hear ting, 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 And then it's open. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful, it's like, and it, you can feel it part and you can hear it. It just, yeah. it's one of those visceral, like, it's but that's that's for the big stone, but like once you get it to this stage, this is a student with one chisel and a hammer, and I, as I say, I'd say three minutes, four minutes to score it and and split that into two slabs. Quarries, uh, it's a marble quarry. The two on the left. This is an ancient marble quarry that was started in Roman times and only recently closed down. So obviously these are open pit quarries, kind of like the granite quarries that we have here. Uh, this one is an excavation into the hillside, a tunnel, basically. These are examples of saws that you would use to cut marble. This is I think that this is about nine feet in diameter. We've put students up there just for fun, and a, and a person stands about this tall on that platform. And this is a, a saw that uses silica to cut. So it's a wet process. And there's some of them go in a water bath. Like these will go into a giant water bath. The whole slab, this one is black, it's oxidized. The whole slab will go in a water bath, and there will be a set of saws a lot like um, you know those egg slicers that have 10 mm -hmm. straps that slice an egg? Mm -hmm. It's like that, but it's rubbing with the silica all the time in the water bath until the stone is sliced all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, this is a centimeter uh, every 15 minutes or so, just to square up the stone. This is the lime man. This guy, um, this is, this is a teeny little kiln that he has, and he only spoke dialect, and we didn't speak dialect, and our Italian, Italian guy 
uh, that spoke Italian, and he had to have a talk first to figure out who was, what words meant what, so that they could understand each other. And this guy lives up in the mountains. So we went up there, and he had some lime that he had burnt, and you burn it for three or four days until the marble um, decomposes into just powder. And he crushes it. And then when you add water to it, it begins to have this chemical reaction, and it can explode. And there are a lot of lime <coughs> workers that are one-eyed or one-handed because of this reaction in the lime cycle. So this is why, um, this is why we buy easy, cheap bags at the store. <laughs> Calce is the Italian for the lime, lime mortar. Which we do use uh, in preference over Portland cement. They don't, they don't use Portland cement at all. OK, so now on to some of the projects that we've done. Um, so the first project uh, eight years ago was to restore this building here, which had no roof on it. In, in most cases, what's happened to these buildings is the rafters have, uh, you know, people have let the roofs leak, the rafters have eventually rotted, and the roofs collapse into the interior of the building. So we had to uh, restore the sidewalls, get them back up to a level condition. We had to replace the lintel in the doorway, and then once we got the walls up to a certain height, start to rebuild the roof structure, which is a, um, the technique they use is they put down a plate, which they call the uh, radice root, and then they put uh, collar ties across the top of it, they call it a chain or a catena, and then you'll see the rafters get notched into the, into the um, ends of the collar ties. And then there are pearl ones on top of it. And I think that I can get this thing to work. Let's see. So these, th this is a roof shingle. <laughs> it's it's about three feet by eighteen inches by you know two and a half three inches thick. Uh, it, you can one person can lift it. It's easier to have two people lift it. And these things, as you'll see in a second are installed on the roof about four inches to the weather. The, the roof on this building, I think I once calculated, it's a small building, it's not that big, uh, it's about 30,000 pounds. Oh. <laughs> How much stone there is you, on the roof. You, was it right that it was a ton a square meter? Or was it 1,000 pounds a square meter? Do you remember? I, I don't we, remember that. We did the math. He's yeah. got a book about it. Yeah. Um, How did you get connected with this project? Um, and the the Canova Association was started by two Americans who've lived there for forty years or something. They're they're Italians at this point, and every year they do something called the Architects Encounter. They invite four or five architects to come and spend a week there just talking and uh, kind of a, just talking <laughs> to each other and. Uh, they invited Steve Bedanes, who some of you may know. He's a Yester Morrow teacher uh, is, and principal of a company called Jersey Devil. Uh, talked about Yester Morrow. The Canova Association said, that sounds great. Can you come and teach? He said, no, I can't, but there are, there are other people <laughs> at Yester Morrow who can. So we went. Wait, didn't mean to do that. Stop, stop. How do I 
go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so now you can see the rafters going up. It's a notch. You can just barely see a notch right there, so that sits into a notch. And then we uh, do a half lap joint uh, of the, the rafters. These are chestnut logs. And here you can see the, uh, the uh, plate, the collar tie, and then on top, the first uh, purlin going on top of that on which the stones start to stack up. And you can see that. So the second layer we carve into semicircles, mostly a decorative thing. I think, and you can see how every one of these stones has been, has the barba on it, the beard, uh, so that you've got a, a shape that sheds the water more easily and keeps it from uh, working its way back into the building. The, st the stones are not tipped very much. They're just barely tipped. Um, How much? Five to 10%. Mm -hmm. So a foot of length, what would be the change of pitch over that foot? It's, uh, it's very shallow. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can hardly tell. An inch, tip. A, a quarter inch? Oh, an inch. Let's an say inch. an inch. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the stones are not less than 15 inches deep front to back. And they're, depending on the mason that's leading, you might have a two inch reveal and you might have a four inch. So it depends on the pitch of the roof, you know, how, how steep those stones are. And the shallower it is, the more snow it'll keep. So you have to play a game with uh, the weight of the, the dead weight of the roof in winter. So some of these shots are a little bit out of sequence. Here's the first uh, purlin, basically, on which the, the stones start. The, Material delivery in this area is always a little bit Top of the bridge. iffy. That's as close as a vehicle could get. They lowered a pallet down onto the path, and then we carried them all down the path. Is there any kind of mortar or adhesive between them? No, There's none. Not in the no. Is water what makes the stone rot? The stone, no, water won't rot the stone. Water will rot the rafters yeah. if you don't maintain the roof. So we talked about rotten stone. Uh, marble does rot. Okay, is that because it's porous and the water gets in? It's oxidized with chemicals in the air. Okay. Yeah. But granite, I, I mean, I suppose in millions of years maybe granite rots as well, but... Well, water, the supersaturation of water, if you put anything in, in a soggy ground, it'll rot. Yeah. Um, so, we, you put a pearl on every two or three courses of stone. So here's the first stone going on. Now you've got two layers on. Then the pearl on goes in. And that sequence just works right. its way up. So one goes against it. It's transferred down to the plate through the right. outside of the stone. But it, it keeps the back of the stone from collapsing into the cavity that is the house. The, the stones are not long enough to reach from rafter to rafter, so you need the purlins to support them. So the roof will be porous for air, but not for water. Right. It? Correct. Yep. And if you're living in the house and it begins to leak, you stick a straw in the leak hole, and when it stops raining, you go out, climb up the roof, and tip the rock up with another shim stone, and you, you stop the leak. If you're not living in the house and it leaks, no one knows, and eventually the, the rafter will rot and it'll implode. So living in the house is the key. As it is here. <laughs> um, so how, what's, the, what's the life of, of the, the wood structure? Part of I think if you, if you keep water from getting to it, it's hundreds of years. Hundreds? Yeah. Maybe more. I don't know. I mean, there, there are lintels that, we, lintels that we've seen in these buildings that are 500 years old. This is looking up from inside when you're looking up at the roof when it's done. This, this guy here. Just before the cap was put on it. What are the two um, white people in the bottom left corner? Down here, these guys? Yeah. These guys are, this one is afraid, and he's the Italian mason, and this is Eddie. And 
Eddie is trying not to fall off the roof. <laughs> and the mason is trying to teach him how we're closing the roof. Because if you look here, see how there's a, like a line across the ridge? So one side is lower and the other side shoots past it. And this is set up based on the direction of the prevailing wind. And then that gap where there's an overhang is infilled with a little bit of mortar so that the water doesn't penetrate and go back in. And so he's teaching Eddie that, and um, Eddie's looking around to see who is taking a picture of him. <laughs> is there a chimney there? Um, this this is a watermelon, and actually here you can see once we dug it all out, because this thing was also full <coughs> about six feet deep. Um, there's a turban down below. Um, there's a, actually the penstock or head race is right behind these people, uh, heading down into there. And this it is comes the mill. Right, right here, you can see it shooting. This is the millstone. So this was a grist mill. There was no heat in it. And uh, this is the invitation we put together at the end of the class and had a reception for the village. It's a municipally owned building. So we were restoring it for the municipality. And this is a picture of it from down below. Most of the pictures that you saw were from up above. This is what it looks like from down below. Is it still in use? Yeah. Now it is. They've restored it so that the water mill, mill is working again as a museum. I mean, it's not a commercial operation by any means, but uh, it's functional. This is uh, going to be the same process. We won't have as many slides of it because you've seen the process. But here's what the project looked like when we started. There's, you know, we've rebuilt the walls slightly. We've started to get the wood in. Actually, this one over here is a student measuring it up, trying to figure out what we're going to do. Here is a fireplace inside. They don't have a chimney per se, but a little uh, hood that directs the smoke into a hole behind that, the hole through the wall. It actually drafts pretty well. We found a stone beside what would be the, the, the hearth here that had a hole in it, which indicated that it would have had a post and some kind of bucket that maybe would turn, and this is where they would make cheese when they're moving the cows up to the high mountains and down to the summer pasture. So this is the dairy, the lateria, where they would make the cheese. And so this particular project is way far away from any uh, vehicles. So we had to use stones that were on the site, and we had to cut the trees down and strip the bark right there at the site and carry them just by hand over to the, to the building. And it looks like there's lots of trees there are, but the ones that are appropriate for building with were not anywhere near where we were building. <laughs> How did you cut the trees down? Chainsaw. A chainsaw. Ooh. We're not, we're not uh, <laughs> purists. <laughs> More like get it done. There's a chainsaw you can see. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, ripped the, some of the logs in half to create purlins, uh, and they use a chainsaw to flatten the top of the uh, of the collar ties. Okay. Chestnut. Chestnut. chestnut, all chestnut. And here, this is a particularly good photo, I think. You can see of the plate, the collar tie, notch, and the rafters sitting in it to keep the. And he says that because he made it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if he's that one. Yeah. Maybe not. <coughs> oh, wow. And that, that's what it is. Here's the finished product. Mm -hmm. right. We should click, click. It took two weeks to do that. It took two weeks of days of hiking up and down the mountain, hauling stone and ourselves. How and many people were involved? Five. And, and Most of these are. Hours? It's a two. It's a two-week class, and we spend half of the time in the studio. So essentially, each of these projects is a five or six-day project. And you start what time in the morning and end? Uh, After we're done eating, and then before we start eating, eating again. again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a regular workday, eight to five kind of thing. Uh, this is another roof, a bakery. We'll go through this one more quickly. See how saggy it is? Yeah. So we took that roof down, took it off. The, the wood was rotten. It looked like it was about to cave in and rebuilt it. 
This guy was our lead mason. We have a different one every year to get a little different flavor. His name is Primo. He was 81 years old. He was no longer allowed by his wife to go to work. So he was mushroom hunting. <laughs> the whole time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> all within the community of Gesh? These are a couple, this is in the region. It's yeah. This one is about a five minute walk from Gesh. You can park close to this building and walk to Gesh in five minutes. So this one is in Kropo Marcho. It's the name of this village. And this is a bakery? Bakery. This is the bakery, yeah. That's virtually finished there. Okay, this uh, is a different kind of project. We did, built a vault over this space here. So uh, the first thing we did is we clean, clean it up. And, and they so don't have five gallon pails you get from Home Depot. Mm. They don't have sturdy, rugged pails. They have these shallow, weird things with handles that don't really work. You have to hold them like that. <laughs> um, one thing we discovered is that the walls were not parallel to each other. We were going to create a, an arched ceiling here and make it a, a cantina. Um, and never having done an arch before, we thought it would be easier if the walls were parallel. <laughs> so we rebuilt this wall over here. In the meantime, while that was happening, we looked for rock, and there being many quarries, we got these end slabs. You know how here in Barry they uh, drill you know, multiple holes around the, the big blocks to separate them from the cliff? Um, and then they saw it up, but the last slab is useless, it's, it's waste. Same here. So this is a waste slab that, a bunch they of waste slabs that, that they gave to us, and we smashed them up into smaller rocks and put them on pallets. Cool. And then uh, we found some, this is our lumber source. We're doing all this on a meager budget, so that's the best lumber that we could buy. <laughs> um, we did buy four sheets of plywood uh, and created the formwork for the arch. And the and Ferrari tractor. Yeah, we got this is a pull, pull start up front with the rope. Oh. <laughs> so from that uh, stone shed, we loaded onto a truck, a truck to Cropa Marcho. And from Cropa Marcha, we loaded it onto that tractor and brought it to within a couple hundred yards of the site and then did uh, hand we over did hand. We did three sets of paso mano. It's, you stand front to back, front to back with a person and you pass and then every 10 stones or so you turn the other way so you get the other side nice. that workout. Yeah. And, um, it looks a little bit like slave labor camp but it's, it's really so much fun. We're singing and dancing and poking each other and can you sing one of the songs? <laughs> I could, but it's really out of context. <laughs> so here, from up above, uh, you're seeing us do, almost close the, the gap on this arch. We started with the first half. We didn't know how much we would be able to do in five days, so we thought, oh, let's maybe we'll do half. But in the end, we were able to do the whole thing. Each one of these stones is uh, basically when you're doing any arch, you point each stone towards the center of that circle, the center of that arch. And you, you put shims in between it to tip the stone to make sure that it is aiming for the center. So is there any mortar between those stones? Yeah. Yes, we did use mortar, uh, lime mortar in here. So on the inside we use all of our fine lumber to you know, shore it up as much as possible. Here's a picture of the formwork before we started putting the stones on. Um, and otherwise, I mean, and, and then once you do that, you can start filling it up. And the, the end result of after you've done the arch and taken the formwork out and whatnot is you fill between the two walls with rubble and create a flat floor on top of it for the next story. And the more weight you put on top of an arch, the stronger it is. Here's the formwork coming out. And here's the formwork completely out. 
And that's what it looked like. That's a five day project. It's amazing what you can do with stone and with six or seven people. <laughs> yeah. So the next year we went into that same space and we built a pizza oven. Yay! And they call this the heart of the town. Because it's it's now in active use, regular use, as being able to feed this community. This was our first uh, experiment in carving stone. We used that for the basically to frame the opening to the oven. <coughs> Um, okay, and then this is uh, the before shot of this wall that we're going to rebuild. And they asked us to recreate this double arch situation in the is in Cropa Marcho, about five minutes walk away. So we, you know, went and kind of examined it and dissected it. You can see from inside of that old arch, you can see the. Uh, the carved stone, and then inside is the structural, uh, you know, laid up stone that is supporting the wall. Our first task was to take the existing wall down. This is what it looked like from the inside of that building. It's the same, same window, this one here, and this one here. And this is our pattern. We carved these stones. We did use power tools for this. We used a grinder um, and, ch and chisels, but rebuilt the walls. And then so the largest stones that we had to carry up there were the lintels for the doorways. It took, whatever that is, like eight people to carry the stone up the hill to <laughs> To the site. It's just up a hill, up a flight of stairs, around a corner, up another flight of stairs, and over a rubble pile. <laughs> Are these all American students or international no, students? No, international. Cool. This girl is English. This guy's American. Uh, this kid came. Uh, she came from Colorado. This guy's from New Zealand. Cool. And we had one guy. Was he from? He's uh, Scottish. And he's an Italian. Guy from Liberia. His first, oh, yeah. name, his first name was King. His last name was George. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the lintel in place. Here's uh, carving the stone. This is carving the stone that creates the, I don't even know what to call it. It's kind of the, the jam. It's right at the top of the door and a return for the door to close into. Um, you can see the thickness of the wall here. Um, yeah. It did get to be over 100 degrees, so we set up a big tarp so that we could stay out of the sun for working. But mm -hmm. it turned out that it was really, really hot at 100 degrees under a tarp. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are building the formwork for the uh, structural arches, which had to be flared towards the, uh, you know, besides. Besides making it the right diameter, it had to flare towards the towards the carved stone. What do you suppose they did hundreds of years ago to build that wooden arch? Is they didn't have plywood and power tools. And Other wood. Yeah, just, I mean, you could build the same. It's just it's faster with plywood yeah. to do the arch, but just you logs could, and sort of form them. And yeah. Yeah. They've been building arches yeah. there. They you know carried on from. Sure. I mean, if, if I didn't have the plywood, I would have just lapped boards. You know, one over sure. the next one. I've also uh, used sandbags before or grain bags. You know, whatever mm -hmm. you can use to, that's malleable. Mm -hmm. Whatever you can put in there that you can get out again. That's right. It's the getting out again part. Yeah. So carving. Jane Fall is super helpful. Yeah, carving going on. Yeah. Here's uh, so these are the, you know, they essentially are veneer stones, although they're four or five inches thick, <laughs> quite heavy. Um, but it's a veneer on top of the and so here from the inside you can see I guess this is the inside maybe it's the out uh, before the veneer goes on so we've got the formwork in there the uh, the wall the structural wall being built 
the veneer coming up to it. And then putting the veneer on, here's the form work coming out. You can see that the, the veneer from the inside, the veneer comes in a little bit farther than the actual stone wall, so there's a return there. And that it gives is that, the door a place to close. That's that carved piece that I pointed out before to, to create the top of the jam. Again, it looks like a work camp, but it's really fun. <laughs> when you take a wall down, do you mark the stones to put them no. back in the same spot? No. Just that all the stones go back is nice. We are making a different spot. We took out three windows and put in two doors, so there isn't the same spot anymore. So, you can just details, you can see the the veneer, the arch, uh, here's from the inside, you can see how the, this flares towards us. Here's that carved piece that kind of locks the veneer into the stone wall, but still is part of the return for the door. And that's as far as we got. It's, they've, they've now progressed. We aren't the only people who work on this. The Canova Association has other people who also do work in Although we're clearly the most productive, for sure, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they have they have progressed farther. Our project for next year, we anticipate putting another single arch doorway here in this wall, and with that, this structure will have four walls, and we'll be able to put a roof on it. Those are two doors, not two windows. Two doors. Yeah, we can go back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah this six six clear to the inside of that. We took the wall down to, I think, this stone right here. So that's all. And it dropped original. below. This is all new. You can see this corner here. And we had to rebuild all this. We put in drainage and then brought this all up. And now, if you look at pictures now, the, grade, the ground is all built up to here. And they've added a new doorway on that side. And this, this room has a floor in it. Now, in anticipation of the will the roof uh, match up with that roof in the background? It will. Yeah. Yep. 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 Wow. And then just one shot of studio work. The, the, most people work outside, but you, we do have some inside space to work. Um, there's fine studio furniture to work <laughs> in. <laughs> but, and these are pictures of the presentations at the end. Um, there's there's no skill pre-required for this course, um, either for the hands-on stuff or for the studio work. You know, some people come and take the course who have some drawing or design experience, but most have none. We teach people how to use drafting tools and how to create a design, floor plans, elevations, what it all means. And you know, by the end of the, the two weeks, they have something to present to guests that we have come in, and uh, it's really quite nice. They, I think, are proud of what they've created. Just another shot of final presentation. What do you survive on? A lot, a lot, lot of food. Yeah, like, like this. Nice. <laughs> These are food shots. Uh, we paid him. That was a segue. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> this was a... Uh, festival up in the mountains that we hiked up to. Big tub of polenta was being made. Um, in this, Italy, if you've, if you've never been, when you order pizza, you get your own one. Yeah. It's They're not much a, more delicate than the ones we got here. It's not a thing. Uh, this is where we usually eat. This, so you can see there's some elevation. The valley down below, we're talking about the palm trees down there. You walk up to where we stay. Uh, this is a you know, sometimes we go out to eat at restaurants, sometimes we have lunch in a field trip situation. And I have no idea whether we're overtime or undertime, but uh, 
final shot here. We do a lot of field trips. And everyone's so happy. <laughs> <laughs> they're all eating. They're all the, you can see the cheeks of food. Uh, but we are at an elevation. Um, if you remember the photo that Mac had of inside uh, the mountain of marble, there is a pit quarry where you could look down, and there's one that you can go inside of. And that's quite a long walk in. And we had just come from there, we're hungry. And looking across, this is the quarry opening of mm. the, uh, the restoration of the Duomo Milano. Mm -hmm. So it's at an extreme elevation. And if you can imagine, how do you get a, a, a slab of stone as big as this table down out of the mountain when you don't have a vehicle? So they had a whole system. There's, there's drawings and images of, I don't know if they use elephants or something, but um, just lowering things down on rollers slowly, slowly, slowly. But the roads are so incredibly steep, it's almost impossible to imagine how you could even do it without the modern tools that we have. And then, but once you get it to the valley, there is a river down there, and the river connects to Lago Maggiore. Lago Maggiore, through a system of canals, connects to Milano. Mm -hmm. So you can get the stone from the valley to Milan, basically cool. by boat. Right. So anyway, that's it? That's, that's what we have. So. Yeah. You're welcome to ask us more questions. We're, we'll hang out as long as you want. But um, if you're interested in this course or know anybody who's interested, we do it uh, last two weeks in July every year. So we've already got one enrollee for next year, which is great. But we need uh, we need seven or eight uh, students for to run the course. What's your max? Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen was difficult. Seven were from Thailand, three were over 70, two were drunk the whole time, one got vertigo and couldn't stand. Oh gosh. So 13 doesn't make it ideal. And Pia, you also offer a stone course on campus. Right? In May. In May, just about every year, I teach the art of stone, which is uh, advanced masonry, art, arty masonry for people from beginner through advanced. It's everything that we do in Italy as a house, we do as a sculpture somewhere in, in Vermont. There are program catalogs here for the winter and lots of books of the Osula Valley. This is one of the most incredible uh, photo books that you'll ever see. And um, these are all in Italian, most in Italian, but really um, historic imagery of yeah. These same, same with this one, a lot of good photos and diagrams of how these buildings are built. Can you both speak fluent Italian? He does. I listen to fluent Italian. <laughs> <laughs> the, course, the course is taught in English, though. We, we do have uh, Italians working with us who are, you know, pretty proficient at English, so that's not a problem. So feel free to linger, come, feel free to come chat with any of us. And there's um, snacks. There's treats, there's some coffee for sale also back there. Um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.